In a shocking 1700s historical document to black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided, and that the Negroes, also known as black Jews, were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your ebook and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option one. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option two, get an easy to read edited ebook plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of ten dollars. Option three, get an audiobook for easy listening plus the easy to read edited ebook and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of fifteen dollars. Learn the real history they don't want you to know. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, Feast of Tabernacles um, started the other other day, uh, Wednesday night, and so it depends on what calendar you're on, of course. And uh, so tonight we're going to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles from a perspective of Yeshua is literally pointing to his feast days in the New Testament. So we're going to take a scripture that he's talking about, it, and we're going to we're going to just pull out a couple of items. All right. A Hebrew nugget is coming from the same resource we used for a couple of weeks, travel in North Africa. And in this particular section, we're still talking about uh, the Jews in, in Libya. We talked about them a, a little bit uh, last week. But uh, in this particular section of the book, it makes a comparison between the Hebrews and the Phoenicians, which I, I think is important for us to, be able to pull out and understand what's being said. And so it said at this time, the term, the language of Canaan, became synonymous with the language of Eber. It said Israelites became the Canaanites even unto uh, uh, Hesperides. I think that's how you said it. So that the Greeks could not distinguish between the Hebrews and the Phoenicians. Uh, this confusion was all the more natural as the Jews of that time were not a uh, pure um, monotheist, as is proven by the religious uh, eclecticism of the, of the colony, which went down with Jeremiah to Egypt. However, this may be, it is certain that about the year 320, and it's talking about 320 B.C., uh, Ptolemy Soter established numbers of Jewish military colonies in Egypt and in Libya in the fortresses which were intended to protect the country against Greek invasions. All right, so this is the first known day in the history of the Jews in Libya. Right, so this was you know, 300 B.C. But what I thought was important there for you to pull out is that the Greeks couldn't distinguish between the Hebrews and the Phoenicians. Uh, the Phoenicians, though, were hermetic. You know, they came from Ham. You know, they were also, I think, uh, you know, uh, Canaanites as well. But, uh, you know, the Canaanites and, the, you know, Phoenicians were all, uh, you know, black people who came from Ham. So I just wanted to note that. So if they couldn't tell the Hebrews from the Phoenicians, then, you know, uh, the, you know, the similar uh, features in the skin. Uh, with they all right so just want to point that out so let's move on feast of tabernacles and we're going to look at how uh this particular section of scripture in the gospels is pointing uh, uh directly to uh yeshua himself now we we talked about the three main seasons so we'll review that real quick we have the spring feast that uh you know these are uh yahuwah's feast days he, he says they are his days feast of passover Feast on Eleven Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and then the summer uh, we got Pentecost or Shavuot, and then the Fall Feast. Uh, we had Feast of Trumpets, uh, the Day of Atonement, and five days later the Feast of Tabernacles, which we're going to talk about tonight. So when we look at the word Tabernacle, you know it should it just should ring something out of spirit to talk about. You know, you, you know we understand these everything's pointing to Christ. And we get to John 1, 14, and it said, And the Word uh, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt uh, means tabernacle. It comes from the Greek word skinu, which means to fix one's tabernacle, have one's tabernacle, abide or live in a tabernacle or a tent. 
And so literally he's talking about coming down, uh, tabernacling with us. This terminology itself should, should just, you know, uh, you know, because we're learning about tabernacle and we learn about the feast days and all these things, it should pique our interest and say, why would, why would that terminology be used? All right. He also tells us uh, in reference to the feast days, again, I used the NOG Bible this time uh, just to give us a, a, a perspective on the wording. It said, therefore, let no one judge you because of what you eat or drink or about the observance of annual days, new moon festivals or weekly worship days. These are a shadow of things to come. But the body that casts a shadow belongs to Christ. All right. So I like I like that uh, terminology. There. All right. So the Feast of Tabernacles, we're going to go to John, the seventh chapter. And in this particular section of scripture, you know, it's there are things happening at the Feast of Tabernacles. So this this should catch, capture our attention if we understand that that every when Yeshua came, he was fulfilling events around his feast days. You know, and you know, if if we only study scripture from a Eurocentric perspective, we're gonna miss all of this. You know, we just we're just gonna walk all over. But if we understand prophecy, we understand that these things are pointing to him and his work. When we see these words, then we have to stop and pause. And when we stop and pause, we say, why is he mentioning the Feast of Tabernacles here? Or in another area, why is he mentioning the Feast of Passover and all these things? What is he fulfilling here? What is he pointing to that he will fulfill in the future? So in John 7, he mentions the Feast of Tabernacles. And he said, after these things, Yeshua walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. It said, now, the Jews' feast of tabernacle was at hand. And his brethren therefore said to him, depart hence and go into G Judea. To thy disi disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. So they were trying to get him, Yeshua, to go. His disciples were trying to get him to go to the feast. Yeshua hadn't got revelation to go at that particular point, so he didn't He didn't want to go. He said, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Yeshua said to them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hates because I testify of it that the works therefore thereof are evil. Go ye up into this feast. I go not yet unto this feast for my time is not yet for come. So we go on to read a little bit further down into John. We see that later on uh he was given the unction to go ahead and go to the feast. So he went to the feast, uh, you know, he stuck to the feast and he made an appearance midweek uh during the feast. But then we get to this section in John uh seven, thirty seven through thirty nine. He's it's still the feast. It's the last day of the great day of the feast because the Feast of Tabernacles is an eight-day feast. Uh, the first day is a Sabbath, and so days two through seven, they're, they're doing uh, all of these uh, uh, celebratory things, and then the, the eighth day is also a Sabbath. So you got two Sabbaths in those eight days. And he said, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood up and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers, will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those dwelling in him would receive for the Holy Spirit not yet given because Yeshua was not yet glorified. All right. So this is a powerful set of scriptures because he's at the feast. Uh, you know, he's he's foreshadowing some things, uh, 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 you know, through the feast. And he's wanting them to capture something because they've been doing this ceremony from day two through day seven up until this point because it was the last day. And so when he uses this language, the people that are there understood that he was referencing the activities that were taking place at the feast. This is why he, you know, made sure that this this terminology was in there. So he starts talking about, uh, you know, thirst and coming to him and drinking. There's something actually going on here. All right. And so uh, when we when we see what was going on at, at the Feast of Tabernacles uh, at nighttime, there was something called the water libation ceremony that was happening. 
and you can read read about it in the Mishnah and describes the temple ritual of the water libation uh, you know that was taking place. And it said, according to the Mishnah's description, water would be collected from the Salome Spring and brought by procession through the water gate and into the temple, where the priest would pour the water into a vessel with two compartments. And I want you to think about these two compartments. One for the water and the other holding wine. It said, then both liquids would be libated up on the altar at the same time. So the altar that they're talking about is not the altar of incense, but the altar where the sacrifice would be made. So here it is, the place where the sacrifice, where the animals would, would uh, you know, when they were slain, would be placed upon. Upon this altar, every night, they would, you know, do a procession around this altar, and they would pour out the water and the wine. So this was a libation. And then on the seventh night, if my sources are correct, they would not only do it one time, but they would they would circle around uh, the altar seven times and then do the libation ceremony on the seventh night. So that's a pretty powerful imagery as well. It takes you back to when we were entering uh, Promised Land, we had to circle around uh, Jericho uh, before the wall fell, fell down. And so in this picture here on the left, you can see where the Pool of uh, Salon would have been located. And then they would go down to this Pool of Salon, which they called the uh, Living Waters. They would take this Living Waters, go all the way back up to the top, and they would perform um, their ceremony. Now, Yeshua is saying, that's me. Now, you know, when we read Scripture, and we see Yeshua because we know that the altar represents the cross. And we see him on the altar of the cross, and he died. And the soldier comes up to him and pierces him in the side. We have a libation ceremony that takes place. And they pierce him in the side. And out of his side came blood and water. Now, this is, this is huge because when, you know, when the priest would take the, it had two compartments. They had the wine and it had the water. We know that wine is, in Scripture represents the blood. That's why Yeshua told us when you do these Things do it in remembrance of me. Take 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 this wine. This represents my blood. The bread represents my body. So when we see this 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 wine and this water. It should remind us that when he was pierced in the side, out of his side came blood and water. So all these things are not pointing a point to him. It should also take us back to Isaiah twelve, the prophecy in Isaiah twelve. And this prophecy in Isaiah 12, it, I mean, it, the language here just is just awesome. You know, when, once you start seeing all these things, it just opens up. So when you read Isaiah 12, you know, I, I, I put the real names in here so we could just really see something extra, right? And it says, in that day, thou shalt say, O Yahuwah, I will praise thee. Though thou was angry, angry with me, that anger is turned away. And thou confidest me. Behold, El, El is a, is a, is another name uh, for Yah. It said, Behold, El is my salvation. Okay, so it reads that, but when you look up the word salvation, uh, it is really Yeshua. So he says, Behold, El is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid for Yah, and it actually uses Yah, the short form, and then it uses the long form. It says, for for uh, for Yah, Yahuwah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation or my Yeshua. You, you can't make this language up. So he's saying El is actually Yeshua. He's, he's the one we trust in. Yah, Yahuwah is my strength. And my song, he has also become my salvation of my Yeshua. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Well, who is salvation? Yeshua. And in that day shall you say, praise Yahuwah, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto Yahuwah, for he had done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thy inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. All right, so this is this is um this is some powerful terminology here, you know, 
when when you really if if you have faith enough to believe it you know if you believe that he's everything if you believe that all these things point to him if you believe that he's the scapegoat if you believe that he's the bullock if you believe that he's the high priest if you believe that he is king if you believe that he is prophet and that all these things point to him and he form all of the work it should be amazing if you don't believe that this is just some words that we're talking about but if you can see this in scripture where everything is beginning to point to him and it's, you know, highlighting him is giving him all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It'll blow your mind. All right. So we understand now that this in this scripture, John the seventh, he mentions Feast of Tabernacles, and then he goes on to to really point out to the people that what you just got through celebrating is really uh, talking uh, about me. All right. So then we get to. Um, the eighth day of the feast of tabernacle. It's a Sabbath. And it's saying Yeshua passed by and he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him saying, Master, who did send this man and his parents that he was born blind? Yeshua answered, neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of Elohim should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while this day, the night cometh when no man can work. Now, he makes this statement because it's a Sabbath. He's going to get pushed back because it's a Sabbath. It's the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacle. So, you know, we always have something to say, you know, because uh, we think we know the law better than Yah himself. And so, but, you know, and when you read later on, they had something to say. But he says in here, he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. All right. And when he when he Yeshua has said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spill and applied the clay to his eyes, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seen. All of this is related in the Feast of Tabernacle. A blind man begins to see. And he begins to see because he was sent to a pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam means sent. So the man in figure and shadow was being sent to the one that was sent. All right. And the one who was sent was standing there telling him to go to sent. All right. So he does. The one who was sent tells him to go do something. He goes, washes, and when he comes back, he's able to see. So this is pointing also to a future work for Israel when he opens the eyes of Israel uh, and Israel believes in the one that was sent, you know, and when they, and when we believe as a whole on the one that was sent, he's going to remove those blindness from our eyes that he said he put over our eyes. He's going to remove those and he's going to open up our hearing just like he said, you know, we hear, but we don't, we see, but we don't. And so this is pointing to that too. So you can understand it's going to be a future tabernacle where he, you know, it's a segment of people that he's going to say, uh, you know, I am the one that was sent. I am the light of the world. Now, why did he use this terminology? Well, on that same night, it, it was that night when they did the libation ceremony uh, with the water and the wine on the altar. All right. So what they would do, they would get some old soul priestly garments. Because once the priestly garments became soiled, they couldn't they couldn't reuse them, and so, uh, but they would take these garments and they would, uh, you know, use use them to light uh, these big, huge menorahs, uh, and 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 you could see that light for miles away because the temple was up uh, on top of a, a, a hill, and once those big menorahs were lit, it was four of them. It would just light up the whole area, and they would use those garments uh, to do it. And so this is why Yeshua always used terminology about being a light, and then he told uh, Israel, you're a light. I'm a light, and you're a light as well, he said, you know. And so he's the light of the world, and he's using that terminology, referring back to this ceremony where they would go in, they would light, uh, light these big menorahs, and then it would show up all over Jerusalem. This is something, this is similar to what it may have looked like uh, during that ceremony when the uh, lights were on. 
So he was saying to to Israel, you know, not only am I the living water, and you know, not only will, uh, you know, you you see blood and water being poured out. I'm the light of the world, and if you'll come to me, you know, I'm gonna make sure that 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 you see. All right. So he's using blindness along with you know uh, physical blindness to point to uh, being able to see physically, but he's also because he's the light of the world. He's talking about a spiritual enlightenment where you're going to be able to see. And he's also going to, his glory is going to light up the world. So there's a lot that he's showing us here uh, in the Feast of Tabernacle. So I just kind of wanted to, I didn't want this to be a long lesson, but I just wanted to point those, those things out. Uh, so go back and read those chapters, you know, John's chapter seven through nine, when he's talking about, uh, you know, it specifically brings out the Feast of Tabernacles so that you can start to see uh, that he's pointing to himself. All right, just one more thing for, for people who are really serious in their studies about the uh, Feast. I just wanted to throw this out there. I don't have full revelation on this yet. I got some ideas, but I'm not there yet. And it shows you uh, the comparison between the uh, Passover and Sukkot, because you know feasts of unleavened bread lasted for seven days, and then now you have the feast of tabernacle that that last. Well, you know anyway, you had those sacrifices for those seven days, right? And it's showing what type of sacrifices were taking place on each day. So um, the bottom uh, section here. Uh, is is a feast of unleavened bread that started the day after Passover, and then we got the uh, feast of tabernacles at, up at the top, which has Sukkot in it. Okay, and then you can see. Uh, so these 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 uh, sacrifices mean something, especially when you start talking about Yom Kippur and and and, and the bullocks being sacrificed for the priesthood, and you know it it is a lot of things that we can. We can uh, infer out of that, but I'm not going to get into that. But I just want to throw that in there in case you do get some type of revelation. You can go back and refer to this particular chart. All right. So he's. Uh... Oh, one more thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Feast of Tabernacles is also called the season of our joy. And it's called the Feast of Nations. So with this in mind, uh, we can look in Luke, the second chapter. And it's written, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings. You know, saw in Hebrew, otherwise known as the gospel of great joy. So because it's called the season of joy, which shall be to all. So because it's called the Feast of Nations, right? So we can see from that package, that the, uh, from that passage, that the terminology that the angel used to announce the birth of Yeshua were themes and messages associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. So language is important to figure out what feast it was. And we've done a study on this to show you that the Feast of Tabernacles was also Yeshua's birthday. But the, the season of joy, when the angels announced this, they were using Feast of Tabernacle terminology. So I want you to just throw that in there as well. All righty. So we'll stop right there. And uh, Samson, you had a question? Yes, sir. Shalom. I, Shalom. Thank you for the message. Awesome, awesome message. I, I may have came in late, Elders, so you may have touched on it. But uh, John five, um, you was uh, I overheard you talking about the pool of Shalom. But in John five, the the five pools of Bethesda. What which what always stumped me was the how spirit comes. Out of uh, one of the pools every year and stirs up the water for healing. Was that Yeshua too? And 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 when it's talking about the feast, I'm 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 thinking that's the feast of tabernacles as well. And is that Yeshua stirring up? But it said an angel. So I, I, I guess I'm asking: uh, Is there any significance from the teaching you just said and uh, two chapters prior? Yeah, uh, there's, there's cool. always there's always uh, yeah significance, you know, which is it deserves its own steady but yeah it, it's pointing to him as well and so you know uh but yeah we'll look at we'll, we'll look into it as far as giving it his own study but 
you know, and that's why Yeshua made sure that, you know, because the man at that pool, at the, in, 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 at that particular pool, when the angel came down to stir it up, you know, he, he said he couldn't find anybody to, you know, roll him down in the water so he could be healed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but Yeshua was on the scene and he was like, you know, the real water, the real healer is here. So he was, he was telling him that, you know, basically I, I'm the one, so there's no excuse because it's not the water that's healing you. Yeah. It's us that's healing you. It's, it's, it's me, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so, uh, so then he was able to heal the man because he was, he was pointing to the fact that that water represent and what the angel was doing was really pointing to him. You get okay. what I'm saying? Yeah, just like the pool okay. of Siloam was really pointing to him. And it's the same feast, look, because verse one, it just says feast, but we're talking that they're, they're referring to uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, correct? Yeah, I would have to go back and look because, you know, all throughout the book of John, it, it is laid out in certain feasts. And there is mm -hmm. one feast in there that it just say the feast, but it doesn't say specifically which one. Right. I, would have, I would have to go back and look and see. Um, uh, so it you could know, be the, the order of things. It could be Passover. It could be, right. you know, it could be, uh, you know, uh, Pentecost. Yeah, I, I just can't. I can't say right off the top. Of yeah, head, yeah, that's but, understandable. That, yeah. that 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 just always stumped me because it's either either chapter five is going simultaneously with seven, or there's years apart or months apart. Yeah, chapter I'm thinking there's. I'm thinking six. they're months apart because I'm thinking in chapter six it's talking about Passover. There's a Passover that happens. And then it jumps from a Passover to Tabernacles. So there's months right. in there. So if that's the case in chapter six, if if I remember correctly, then chapter four, yeah, six four. Mm -hmm. Then 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 chapter five would have to be prior to that Passover. You get what I'm saying? So there was a Passover and Feast of Tabernacles. So something was happening before the previous Passover when we're talking about the other pool. So it because it's in sequential order. And it's a significance, I'm thinking it's five of them. Okay, well, yeah, that just always stumped me. Thanks, Elder. I digress. All right. Uh, Patrice? Good evening. I've got a question about the chart you put up with the um the sacrifices, like with the bulls and the rams and the lambs. Is that per household? And was it optional, like for you to sacrifice 13 bulls? You can do two or two rams, 14 lambs, or one goat. Was that optional per household? No, no, that was not a household thing. That was something that the that the priest had to do. But this was and, what the priest was doing as well for them. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, that it wasn't required in the houses. This was required by the priest in either the tabernacle or the temple. So it wasn't like Passover, okay? Right, right. All right, thank you. All right, uh, who is next, Sylvia? Shalom, huh? Shalom. Uh. For the lesson, all I can say is Aman. I mean, it 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 was very very good, especially the uh, piece that you were reading where you substituted the original words in that in that piece. And as you were reading it, <laughs> I thought about Yeshua, and I remember in one of our lessons we were speaking about how the Spirit came into um, physical form into our manly form. And that Yeshua wouldn't have remembered from where he was in his in the heavens. And um, when he was a child, he went to go study. So there's a gap of like 20 something years. And in that study and in learning the word, learning the uh, prophecies and the and the writings, and then coming to realize that this prophecy was him. It had to be mind-blowing, mind-blowing. And when once he got to baptism, and I, and that probably probably would have sealed it, when he went to the baptism and John baptized him and what the Spirit said to him during that. It's just amazing. And I just saw that, and I just wanted to share it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good stuff, you know, and, and we know that Yeshua was... Uh that he had the revelation of that he was his, he he was the son at 12 years old because you know he you know when they were leaving one of the feast uh you know 
Mary or Miriam figured out that they, he wasn't with them and they got worried and they went back and they found him sitting in the temple. And, and one of the comments that he made, you, you know, uh, you, you know, I know I need to be about my father's business. Hey, so, you know? so, so, so he had a revelation at that particular point of who he was, but he was walking by faith. You know, he was learning, uh, mm. Because he had to walk by faith on this earth, just like we walk by faith. So he 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 always would say, "I'm not I'm not doing what I want to do. I'm doing the things that I, I only the things that I hear of my of my father." That's why one minute he didn't go to the feast of tabernacles, and then the next minute he he need, he he knew he needed to go because he was walk, he was walking by faith. He wasn't playing games. He just hadn't heard that it was where he needed to go yet. So yeah, uh, he walked by faith, and that's why he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Because had he walked mm -hmm. in it differently, then he's asking us to walk. It would have been it's it's a fraud. It would be fraudulent, right? Even when he told his mother at the at the wedding feast, he says, "Not my time yet." Mm -hmm. But yet, you know, she said, "Oh, do what he tell you to do." <laughs> right. So he was he was growing, he was learning, and he was figuring out that this is what my in, in regards to how, even in his own mind, it didn't make sense at times. Okay, this this doesn't make you sure. Okay, just what you're telling me to do. This is what I'm gonna do. But it didn't seem to be following the plan. You know, even when he was encountering people outside of Israel coming to him, that that didn't seem right. He said, "I only came for the law sheep." Israel. That's that was my plan, and 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 but. His father, he knew that nobody could come to him unless the father sent them. So if this, if this Syrio Phoenician woman was coming to him, he knew that his father had sent her. Because she's like, I understand, you know, you don't give it to the dog. But even the dog can eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And she had great faith. And so this woman come up to him with great faith, my father had to send her. Mm. And, and so the scripture was saying he was just blown away. By by the faith that some of the people outside of Israel had in him, and it's two times that he was amazed at their right. faith and the lack of his own faith. Mm. So that means that he was he was still learning about some events as he was as he was here. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Aunt. Yes, ma'am. All right, Lewis. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say, I think it's just an amazing picture of what he was doing to show and fulfill prophecy, as well as teach the people. He was doing so many things kind of at the same time, because, you know, when you were explaining that, what's amazing is, you know, you you look at what's written in John chapter five, and he just told them that, you know, it is he that came by water and blood. You know what I'm saying? And those are the three that bear witness, water, blood, and the spirit. And they just witnessed, as you were explaining, the Beit Hashoiva, which is the uh, the water libation ceremony. And seeing these things happen, and with the willows, they would have had this valley, I think it's called the Motsi Valley or something like that, which also means scent. And they're going to the Pool of Siloam, which means scent. And they're waving in the willow leaves, which are bringing in the Ruach, or it's supposed to symbolize that, on the seventh day, which is like, I think it's called Hashanah Rabbah. And then on the great eighth day of the feast, which is um, Shemini Aseret, you know, they come into the court of women where the lights are, and he's sitting there on the ground. And, you know, when you look at what it says, how he wrote their names in the earth, you can look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13, where he just talked about being the fountain of living waters. And it says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. They that depart from me shall be rent in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. It's like he tied all this together while teaching them. And those same people are going to see him at the cross and the blood and the water came out. And I know somebody out of the crowd had to recollect back when he was saying and doing all these things. I mean, it's just a beautiful picture. Uh, and, and it's amazing how he's doing all these things simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, that that's amazing. I love what you brought out, especially, you know, going to the, the court of the women and all that type of stuff. I did go back and look at that. 
But that's that's good information. So yeah, it just he's just tying all that tying all that together, man. And 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 I love the way you laid that out. You know, he just keeps adding and adding to uh you know what what he's what he's done for us. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right. Um anybody else? All right. Good stuff, man. That's good stuff, Lewis. I love, I love that what you were talking about on the, on that, man. I, uh, you got me fired up to go back and look at that again, that part again. So yeah. All right. Anybody was, else? Oh yeah. Go ahead. It was, and it's crazy how people just deny him, and he's done all these things, but yet still deny. It's crazy. Yeah, it's it's he just uh, you were kind of your your mic was going in and out, but I think I, I got what you said. Yeah, it is amazing, uh, you know what what he's done, and you know, and yet we still doubt him at times. You know, I, I, yeah, <laughs> and I and I and 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 I'll say this: we'll get out of here. But it just amazes that we can we can layer these things, layer on layer, prophecy on prophecy, and show who he is. And how awesome he is and, 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 and bring out these things that how he's fulfilling scripture. And all it takes is for some one person to say something to us and it just throws off our whole our whole theology. That just that amazes me. But anyway, uh I pray that he just keeps showing us who he is, you know, and, and how he's got this thing lined up. He's he's showing us who he is. And don't be a part of the group that the that the parables talk about. How you get a good you get a good word. And it, when you minute you get that good word, the enemy comes along and it don't take root in you. Either because of the cares of the world or you know, because trouble comes. You know, then then we 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 offend it because of the trouble, or it just don't take root. As soon as we get it, the enemy come and take it away from us. Don't be one of those three. Be you know, be one of the ones that it take root in, and you begin to bear fruit, thirty, sixty, a hundred fold. Be one of them. Don't let somebody come in later on today and say something to you, or you go listen to somebody else's video, and then all of a sudden everything you've learned this week is gone, and you can't even relate what you learned this week to what you learned last week. It's like last week didn't even happen. But if we tie all these things together that Yeshua is giving us, you know, it'll make you strong, it'll build your foundation, it'll dig you deeper in him. And so everybody just can't come along anywhere in the doctrine and just throw you off. You get what I'm saying? So, all right, so let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for revealing yourself to us, continually revealing yourself to us, showing us who you are, showing us the shadows and the fulfillment, showing us the pictures and, and, and all of these things so that you can prove to us that it's your testimony, it's the spirit of prophecy. Father, we ask you to continue to remove the scales from my eyes. We ask you to continue to move the mud from our ears so we might hear correctly, we might see correctly, and seek after you in the way that you would have us to do those things. Forgive us for our many sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In your son, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. All right. Shalom, everybody. Shalom. 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 Have a great week. In a shocking 1700s historical document of black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided, and that the Negroes also known as black Jews were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your e-book and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option 1. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option 2. 
Get an easy to read edited ebook, plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of $10. Option 3 Get an audiobook for easy listening, plus the easy to read edited ebook, and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of $15. Learn the real history they don't want you to know.